Well, the truth is that Lechanyani's late life was sad. It was pathetic. Um, starting in the, probably in the 1930s when he began... This is the third uh, and the final video. On this one, we'll just be looking at uh, how ZXCC went about spreading to other countries. Not only that, but also to the late life of uh, Engenase Lekhanyane. And uh, with me, as always, I cannot be producing this information to you guys. I'm not that well equipped. I'm not that well enlightened. So hence, I have a guest speaker. And uh, it is none other than Dr. Barry Morton. Uh, Barry Morton, how are you today? Doing great, Percy. Thanks. Good to be here again. It's always a pleasure to have you on the channel to give us uh, some of the knowledge that you have gathered through a number of years of research, dedicating most of your time and your life, uh, digging deep into what uh, ZXCC looked like back then, how it was established. And for that, we do thank you. So, yeah, we have uh, covered the early lives of Agnes Lichanyane. We have uh, opened some doors to see what kind of theology practices the church were practicing during the early times of establishment. And uh, we have seen also that, you know, even though Zexis struggled to find reg registrations, they did manage somehow to sort of like be uh, an official church recognized by the government of South Africa as a, a, a religious institutions. And uh, that's basically where we left off with uh, the second part of our video. So now I think uh, we can start by looking at uh, how the ZCC go to other countries. So Dr. Barry Morton, could you help us to understand how did the ZCC get into Botswana, Mozambique and uh, other countries, because we know that it does not only exist in South Africa, but also to the nearest countries. Yeah, well, the ZCC was international basically from day one, because one of the founding members uh, was Samuel Moyo, who later called himself Samuel Mutendi, who, uh, who took the church to Rhodesia, uh, from 1925, and he was in his own right an extremely successful evangelist uh, who, in some ways, he mimicked Lechanyani. He walked around with a big stick, healed people with it, took a big entourage with him, singing, dancing. He was a very charismatic individual. So from, from the 1920s on, uh, Mutendi was... Uh, built up a big, probably the biggest part of the ZCC, or bigger than any other congregation by far. Um, and, I mean, he was not, although he converted many people, he ran into a lot of opposition um, in his, in the area he was from in the, in the Midlands of Rhodesia or Zimbabwe. And uh, he was heavily opposed by the Dutch Reformed Church missionaries and the local chiefs. And it took him a good, uh, at least a decade to really overcome that opposition. And probably starting in the late 30s onwards, he really started to build up a huge section of the ZCC. Like I said, bigger than any other part of it. So that international section was going from day one. And then uh, Botswana also became a big hotbed for Enginus Lechanyani starting in 1937, uh, when uh, one of the chiefs, uh, the Botswana had eight recognized chiefs, and one of those chiefs had been deposed by the British for his bad behavior, gambling and drinking and generally neglecting his duties, although he was a very popular guy. So there was a movement that spread up to 
bring him back to the chieftaincy. This is an area called Katleng. It's it's sort of near the modern day capital of Botswana, based in Machudi. And it's one of it's a fairly large group. And what happened is that this group of opponents or opponents of the present chief or the supporters of the deposed chief uh, were looking for ways to bring him back into power. And they tried a number of different methods, political mobilization, witchcraft. They tried it all. And then some of them or one or two of them had been converted by Lekanyani while working in Johannesburg on the Rand as migrant workers. So these individuals who'd been converted recommended to the group that they use Enginus Lechanyani, the power of this prophet in Petersburg, to reimpose uh, the, the deposed chief back to power. So that's what they did. A whole group of people went and they gave Lechanyani like a hundred cattle, a hundred head of cattle. They went there, they went to Lekanyani's headquarters, and he worked with them, he prayed with them, and then he moved, but he, he came by car, by his new car, and he drove to Botswana, and he met the deposed chief, and he told him, you know, what you need to do is join the war effort. You need to serve in the armed forces as the British want you to do and as he didn't want to do. And if you join the war effort and you go serve in the British army, when you come back, they will put you back in charge. That was the advice that Enginus Lechanyani gave the, the deposed chief. So the chief or the deposed chief uh, reluctantly agreed to serve in the British armed forces. And in the meantime, his actual, this group, which became ZCC, it was about a thousand people, while the deposed chief was in Europe serving under the British army, his followers actually managed to take control of this section of Botswana, right, for about three or four years during World War II, because the British lacked personnel, they were all serving in the, in the army, and so the ZCC actually controlled part of Botswana for about three to four years. Um, and they instituted all of Lechanyani's uh, policies. Uh, they had, it became the official church of this area of the country. Um, so let's just say that the ZCC had a big impact in these two countries fairly early on. Uh, they weren't going to move into Mozambique, Swaziland, Lesotho for a while. That, that's going to come more in the 50s and 60s. But during the lifetime of Enginus Lechanyani, then, it successfully penetrated two different countries, and these, the membership in these two countries was, pro, was bigger than any congregations he had elsewhere. So, for instance, there were way more members in Botswana than you'd find in Johannesburg or in Pretoria, and the membership in Zimbabwe is bigger than all of them. So uh, from an early standpoint, then, these, these people were communicating with Lekanyani by the mail, by telephone, or he would go in his car to see them, and then they would bring the offerings uh, to Petersburg, to his headquarters, and then they would get blessed water, uh, they would get the uniforms, the badges, they would get that from him and go back home. So there, there was this constant communication between the local and the international. Uh, by the way, to all our viewers, uh, the information that Dr. Barry Morton is providing in this video, it's not going to be that much. So if you want in-depth details regarding this timeline and the information, this is where you should go. This is where you're going to get the information. And this is the book which he invested so much energy, so much uh, of his time writing it has more details than uh, a video can cover so i would encourage you to go to amazon and then uh, purchase this book right now it's probably going for 300 350 somewhere around those lines uh yeah so do get this book if you wanna 
uh, acknowledge, uh, increase your knowledge in terms of this, this information that we're trying to spread out. So, uh, as you were saying, uh, that uh, ZCC did get to other countries such as Botswana, it seems like they didn't find it hard to find success and for them to be rooted in that country. But then as ZCC moved on to other countries, were the civilians that side resistance? And if they were, what sort of like challenges uh, did the ZCC uh, come across as they were spreading to other countries uh, other than maybe Botswana? Well, the ZCC faced tremendous opposition wherever it went. Um... The big reason is that under colonialism, the government gave the chiefs a lot more power than they had had in the past, and the ZCC systematically undermined the authority of the chiefs wherever it went because it insisted that the followers follow the laws of Lechanyani and not the, the laws of the culture or the country. So wherever it went, the members did, refused to engage in the projects of the for better or lack of worse, of the tribal administration, and they refused. They wouldn't show up to do their communal duties. They refused to pay labola if they were marrying. They only married each other. Or wives, if they were converted, would get divorced from their husbands, refuse to see them, and move in with a man from the church, etc. And uh, they refused to get involved in health initiatives, to be vaccinated, uh, to have their animals vaccinated. And in countries that are very rural, this was uh, extremely uh, upsetting to the control of the male elders who ran the chieftaincy and who controlled the people in it. So it created massive tension. And ultimately, for instance, in Botswana, when the chief was in, reinstated, the exiled chief came back from the war and was reinstated. He found that the ZCC was so unpopular that even though Lechanyani had advised him to go to the war and prophesied you'll be you'll come back, he threw the ZCC out and he expelled them. And then every other chief in Botswana banned the ZCC. So the ZCC would not make a real comeback until the 1960s when they were able to have a freer hand in, in, in evangelizing. And then right now they're just like by far the biggest church, but they had a period where they were, they were banned and they were persecuted. And Zimbabwe had a similar, similar issue, but it took Mutendi a good 10, 15 years to, to start getting support from the chiefs who then became much more in his camp uh, than Whereas initially, you know, he is having to have all his services in secret and getting arrested all the time. So it it really took, in both countries, a long time uh, for the ZCC to be established. But now ZCC is number one in Zimbabwe, definitely number one in Botswana. I mean, it's not even close. Um, and they're very visible organizations. Yeah. As this is taking place, uh, the ZCC is spreading out to other countries. This is happening during sort of like the late life of uh, the man himself, Eminase uh, Lekanyane. I, I just want to uh, help out the viewers and also myself just to understand how his late life looked like. I heard you mentioning that, you know, he was driving a car. But what more uh, can you tell us about his late life? And uh, also, uh, how did it all end? How did his life end? Well, the truth is that Lechanyani's late life was sad. It was pathetic. Um, starting in the, probably in the 1930s, when he began associating with a lot more Europeans in terms of buying land and having lawyers and having more shops of his own and trading with the establishment. I mean, he began drinking and he was get you know, alcohol. You couldn't drink hard alcohol if you were an African. It was not allowed. It was illegal in South Africa. But his white friends were giving him alcohol and he became an alcoholic. So as his life 
progressed. And as he was having more and more success internationally and as, as his organization was growing, he became actually more and more remote. And when his first wife died around early 1940s, his second wives pretty much, I don't know if the words imprisoned him is correct, but they shielded him and let the alcohol come in and they put up, they just made it very difficult to see him. Only the inner circle really interacted with Enginus at the end of his life. He would only come out several times a year to see his followers. So he had a very, the end of his life did not go well. He was preaching his whole life against um, Western medicine, but meanwhile, he was being treated by a white doctor from Petersburg um, and who was brought in all the time. But I, I don't think, I mean, I believe he died of probably of liver disease. Um, so his his late life was very secretive and his his family really protected him or kept him in hiding per se, while a whole bunch of problems began to come uh, well up from underneath, which is who's going to run this organization since uh, Enginus kept drinking apparently until the end. And then uh, as Enginus Lefanyan passes on, we found ourselves with sort of like a, a struggle, a conflict in terms of how then uh, does this leadership of the ZCC, which is now quite well known and quite sort of like influential, uh, not just in South Africa, but also in the uh, surrounding countries. Could you tell us why was there no smooth transition of leadership from the man himself towards someone who comes why was there so much uh, conflict around uh, the leadership transition? Well, I think there's I, there's a bunch of reasons. You could say on one level, uh, Enginus never made his plans clear. There are allegations that he made wills, but there's no will has ever been produced. Then there's alleged deathbed confessions or et cetera, but again, I don't find them credible. So Enginus, as far as I can tell, the reason behind it all was that he refused to, to create a viable succession plan. Then uh, another reason, you have to understand there's a lot of misinformation about the ZCC succession out there because Right now you have, on the one hand, you have the Dove section and then you have Star and each one makes complete, competing claims that neither side could be true. If one's true, the other's false or vice versa. And I think these competing claims between Dove and Star have completely uh, erased what actually really happened. Okay? And I, and, uh, when Enginus died um, in 1948, he was buried within 24 hours, okay? There was no, the funeral was attended by very few people and it was done very secretively and very quickly, okay? And then his brother declared a year of mourning following which there was going to be a succession because there was no obvious plan. So the family, that controlled Enginus at the end of his life and controlled his very quick funeral to keep it quiet, they said, we'll decide in one year. And this led to intrigue, infighting, whatever you want to say. It led to a lot of problems because there were basically four different contenders to take over the organization. Okay, you have. Enginus's brother, Paulus, who was the one who was behind his quick burial and insistence we needed a year. There was the eldest son, Barnabas, who seems to have been the number one sort of organizer, at, at least at headquarters. And then there was the uh, 
what's the uh the by in the sun the the son who goes off and is naughty for a while uh what's the prodigal son edward okay edward who had vanished for several years he was probably in jail for some of it and then he was also evangelizing amongst migrant workers as well and then on the other hand you have another the younger son joseph who seems to have been a favorite of the more rural constituency of the ZCC. So you have four contenders. Well, what happened? The one who probably would have been chosen, Barnabas, the oldest son, died in early 1949 as a very young man because he wasn't vaccinated. The ZCC didn't vaccinate and he dies of smallpox, should never have died. Okay, he should have been vaccinated. Most people in Southern Africa were vaccinated against smallpox, but unfortunately, Barnabas died. Nobody wanted Enginus's brother, apparently, or he wasn't able to get a big enough support base. So that leaves the prodigal son, Edward, whose followers are all migrant workers on the Rond, who called themselves the the so-called Western faction or the Reef faction. And then you had Joseph, the younger son, who was heavily supported by the family, as well as uh, they were supported by Botswana and also by the Pedi, the Limpopo area uh, supporters. So you have these two camps, the migrant workers and the more traditionalist group. Um, each one has several prophecies from allegedly coming from Enginus that said that their guy's the right guy and you i'm sure you've heard some of these prophecies before okay i believe that they're all made up or dubious okay um they seem to be have made up after the fact because nobody expected barnabas to die he was still young so the question then really is why why was there the split? Well, the answer is that the South African police got involved or the South African government got involved and they sent the Petersburg police force to have an election 11 months after Enginus's death. And so they held an election at Moria and Edward was voted by a majority to be the leader of the ZCC and and Joseph and Paulus were runners up. Okay. Apparently it was doesn't seem to have been that close. So the so-called Western faction or the migrant workers outvoted Joseph. And then in the aftermath of the vote, the Joseph supporters wouldn't accept it. And then a lot of People from the Rond who were allegedly a lot of Tsotsis, gang members, allegedly came in to Maria and basically expelled many of the Joseph's voters, expelled them quite forcibly or violently from one section of the farm to the other section of the farm. And so in the end, Joseph refused and his followers refused to accept the decision, and then they ended up in the long run forming the St. Enginus or the Dove section of the church. But the reality of the situation, undeniably, is that Edward and the Star won the vote, which was sanctioned by the South African government. And then upon winning the the, the election, the votes, Edward does not lay back. It seems like this man strives to see the success and you know the legacy of ZCC just to continue. So what could you sort of like uh, tell us about what he did or well, what made him to be sort of like so successful? What method did he uh, sort of embark on in terms of continuing where his father uh, sort of like left and ensure that his vision of seeing Zexis spread out continues? Well, I mean, in my opinion, Edward was just a genius. 
I mean, he's one of the great unknown geniuses in South African history. I, I don't, I think the guy is incredible because he actually, under his leadership, the ZCC star grew by far more than it ever did under his dad. And not only that, but I think, I think Edward was just, if you, I, I don't think there's anyone in his league. If you look at an African under apartheid, who was the most successful at anything? Edward was in a league of his own. I mean, he created, he went from like 50,000 to the numbers range to near half a million people that he brought in. Um, maybe that's an exaggeration, but 300,000 at least. He was the one who began having these massive pilgrimages to Maria every year, whereas under it, his dad, it had just been a couple thousand people. Now we're looking at tens and hundreds of thousands of people showing up. He was a business mastermind who was incredible at making money and building up the church's coffers through a whole bunch of business ventures. We're talking insurance, transport, trading, crop production, crop milling, everything, you can name it. He he made money all kinds of ways. He was he didn't use any of his family members to do it. He brought in church members who were not his relatives and he had a his his the group behind him was extremely smart and organized and talented. And not only that but Edward was the one in the ZCC who figured out that, you know, we can't oppose the apartheid government. He, there's, he, at the beginning, he did not like the NP, but after a few years, he realized that he had to make peace uh, with Vervoord and apartheid. And he claimed to go along with it, and he was friendly with the Afrikaner politicians let's say friendly, he wasn't antagonistic to them. And so, um, I mean, e Edward was a tour de force. Um, he, he got a, he went to university, got a divinity degree. He changed some of the services in the star. He flew all over the world with his buddies. They went to Israel and, uh, learned about the Bible that way by being in Israel. He went to Japan, America to see, you know, the trends in the global church. Um, he was, nobody has ever written about Edward in depth, but I'm telling you, this guy was a genius and uh, underrated by history, in my opinion. Um, so I, I think when I look at it, Edward is, it's, it's more crucial to the massive growth of the ZCC than his father who established it. He just figured out how to spread uh, the ZCC template to a mass audience in the growing cities of Southern Africa. Yeah, truly indeed sort of a more remarkable way compared to his father in terms of looking at where he found the church to be and also his father. As you said, he was struggling during his eight years, but uh, the man did uh, take the XC to sort of like a different level uh, through his evangelism methods, and, uh, uh, his reformations method that he brought into the church. But yeah, uh, all the information that we are uh, discussing here the information that you've been providing mostly it has to do with the early ZCC so my question to you would be uh, do you see a notable difference between the early ZCC and what we could call the modern ZCC is there a notable difference in terms of what beliefs uh, structure practices or still what was is is what it is right now. This is a hard question to answer. Um, I think I think that one thing that's obviously different 
is the whole Makuku organization which exists in Star. Because that organization only began with the ejection of the pro-Joseph faction in Maria in, in 1949. So the Makuku, the, the male dancing, uh, the white shoes, that, that only comes from Edward. So, and that is the most visible, and at least in my experience, is the most visible thing about the ZCC are the male Mukuku sections who put on these, uh, you know, they attract a lot of attention with their services and with their uniforms going to church on Wednesdays and Sundays. Um, and the, I think that's a big change. I think the the other change that was made to make the ZCC a secretive business juggernaut, I think that's a lot different than what happened under Enginus, who, well, let's be honest, he was successful himself. Uh, he wasn't a poor man, but he he didn't organize the church the way Edward did, which is a lot of effort going into making money. Okay. And then I think in the end, the Dove section was forced to copy a lot of what the star did to stay current and to catch up. And I think, I think the Dove has made in recent decades has done very well. And I don't know a lot about that, but uh, so I'm not going to tell you, I know, but I know that in certain senses, they've mimicked the star's success. So I think that's different uh, in terms of, you know, is the ZCC preaching different? I think the the collective mentality is largely said the same, which is you join the church, you don't discuss it with outsiders. There's this paranoia going on. Um, a lot of they're still preaching using faith healing as the main recruitment technique. They're still using the same sections of the Bible uh, regarding Zionism. So I, I, I think a lot, in a sense, the teaching and the collective mentality is maintained intact. But, uh, you know, when you look at something like Makuku, I mean, that was not part of Enginess's ZCC, even though the members might believe it is or think that it is. It's not. It's 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 a more recent introduction. Uh, time has run out, but there is one question that still remains and I would uh, appreciate for uh, us to close with these questions. And I think uh, it's one which, you know, a lot of people are asking uh, about the ZCC. So let me ask you and hear your opinion. Do you think the ZCC is a cow? <laughs> Yeah, it's a cult in the same way uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Mormons are a cult. In my opinion, the ZCC resembles the Mormon church more than anything, especially the star section. So if you consider Mormonism a cult, then ZCC is a cult. If you consider them a sect or a... Yeah, I know the ZCC, they hate the word sect. They hate the word cult. They claim that they're the church that is destined to be the the church that will be the only church left at the in the end. That's what they say. So they say these distinctions are meaningless. We read the Bible. We follow the Bible. We pray. We attend church all the time. Uh, so don't... These... These labels you're throwing at us are either racist or they're making fun of poor people who believe them. Uh, don't those are made up by outsiders, not by us. So honestly, the answer is, you know, look at the Mormon Church. They're another successful group in America. They're a lot like ZCC in so many ways. If you think they're a cult, which I don't think I I believe that. I don't think that the ZCC members are also necessarily in mental lockstep with the leadership as much as people think. It's just because they don't want to tell you about the church doesn't mean that they're necessarily just believing everything and following orders. They There tends to be a lot of back and forth discussion. 
in the ZCC about all kinds of things. And a lot of the members don't wear badges. You know, I know they're supposed to wear a badge, but a lot of them don't. They just say, hey, I'm more than I'm a person. I'm more than just a ZCC member. I don't wear it. I wear it to church. I'm proud to be a member. But when I go to my job, I'm, I'm me. I'm doing my job. I'm an accountant. I'm a, you know, so it's, it's not necessarily, I don't think it's like Scientology or anything like that, where there's this really uh, strong attempt to really control you and your money to the max. I don't think it's quite like that. Uh, thank you for today, uh, Dr. Perry Morton, for providing us with uh, so much insightful information regarding uh, how the ZCC uh, found its food in, into other countries such as Botswana, uh, Mozambique, uh, and then also touching into the late life of uh, Enginasa Lefanyane and uh, the, the person who came after, which is uh, Edward. Uh, but yeah, people, just remember that uh, the information that we provided does not go as far as the information that this book provides. So this book, is it for a ZCC member? Uh, is it for a non-ZCC member? My answer is, is, is that, you know, whether you're a ZCC member, whether you're a non-member at a change, you will definitely provide, uh, you will definitely benefit from this book. It's both written from the perspective of someone who wanting to understand his church or an outsider wanting to understand the establishment of ZXC. So do go ahead to Amazon and uh, purchase this book. From me and uh, Mary Morton, it's fine. See you. <laughs>